All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, so we're in the part four of the course now. This is the last major part of the course um, where we talk about uh, Java's generic systems. OK, so earlier in the course, uh, we implemented a stack of int or a stack of string. Um, I guess we've done both. We've done one using um, a list, and we've implemented another stack using an array. So for the array-based stack, uh, we had a class that looks something like this. So we had a stack called int stack. Internally, it had an array of elements that we used to store the uh, elements of the stack. And we had a, uh, a field called top index that stored the location of the top element in, this, in the array. Right? And then push and pop had a little bit of code in it, but otherwise um, that was the complete implementation of our stack class. Okay, now suppose you wanted a stack of strings or a stack of anything else, right? If you want a stack of dates or a stack of doubles or a stack of something. Um, so before Java introduced uh, what they call generics into the language, um, one solution would be, well, you make up another class. Right? So if you wanted a stack of strings, you would make a new class called string stack. And if you would look at the implementation of string stack, you would see it's basically a copy of int stack. Everything's the same, except your array is now an array of string instead of an array of int. Your push method now pushes a string onto the stack, and your pop method now pops a string off the stack. If you actually look in the code inside of the methods, uh, so for example, pop, again, almost nothing changes. Pop now returns a string. The only thing that changes is the element type. Uh, that you retrieve um, in the middle of the method. Everything stays the same. So the problem with this uh, the problem with this solution is that um, you end up copying code over and over and over again. Right. Uh, if you make a state uh, stack of dates, you now have a date stack, and guess what? Like a few a few locations in your code change, but otherwise everything's the same. Right. So the only thing that changes, uh, the only changes that are made are related to some types. Right. You substitute string for int in a few places. If you had a different type, you'd substitute that type for int in a few places. Right? And so it'd be nice if the uh, compiler could do this work for us. Instead of the compiler having to make a new class every time, why can't the compiler synthesize a new class for us every time right? and let it do it automatically? And so this is the idea of what Java generics are for. Right? It lets you create, uh, or lets the, um, it lets you provide the illusion of creating a new class for every different type, um, rather than uh, and having them, that type would be automatically generated, rather than the, the programmer having to generate that type themselves. Right? This isn't exactly how it works in the Java language. Right? So in Java, we don't actually do the substitution. Something else happens instead. Uh, but there is a very popular language where exactly this thing happens. So in C++, the compiler actually synthesizes a new class for every uh, different type uh, of class that you want. OK, so there is another solution. So the other solution is to take the Python route of doing things, right? So our array uh, for our int stack would be an array of int. But we could instead make that an array of object. And as soon as you make it an array of object, you can push, you can have a stack that can hold any element type. Remember, everything is substitutable for object in Java, right? So imagine we made a stack using a list this time. So instead of an array, I'm going to use a list, right? And that list is now a list of big O object. Uh, again, there's almost no change here, right? So the only thing now that changes is this thing here, right? We say we have a list of object, right? Pop now returns an object, and push now accepts an object. Otherwise, uh, everything is the same as our original list based stack. Right. And this actually does solve uh, the problem where uh, we want to create one class that can hold any element type. Right. It's a little bit inconvenient when you use this class. Right. So the declared type of our elements is big O object. Right. So whenever I pop an object, uh, sorry, whenever I pop the stack, I get back a big O object. Right. So whenever we pop the stack, we get back a big old object instead of the element type that you actually pushed onto the stack. So that means if I want a stack of, if I know, for example, I have a stack and it's only strings on the stack, 
right? Then every time I pop an element off the stack and I want to use that string, I have to cast the object to string. So here's my stack using uh, my new list objects stack class, right? I know I'm only pushing strings onto the stack, right? So I'm going to push the three strings here onto the stack, right? And now I'd like to pop the stack, right? And get the string that I just popped off the stack, right? I know it's a string. I'm the one that pushed the, pushed the things onto the stack in the first place, right? But this doesn't work, right? Why doesn't this work? Because S is a string, right? Pop returns an object, right? Object is not substitutable for string, right? Object is a super class of string. It's not a descendant class of string. So I can't write string S equals something pop or a string stack pop, right? Instead, when I pop the stack, I have to cast the object to a string. This is safe and it always works right? because I know that I only pushed strings onto the stack in the first place. Right. So that's a little bit inconvenient, but it's not terrible. OK, there's a more serious problem. Uh, the more serious problem is that uh, you end up with a collection that behaves like a Python collection. Right. So in Python, if you have a list or anything else in Python, right, you can add whatever elements you want to that list. Right. So you can add a float to the list, then you can add an int, then you can add a, a, a string and then something else. Right. Uh, and that's because in this case, we have a stack of big old objects. And every reference type is substitutable object. Right. So I can make a stack that's only supposed to hold strings, right? But there's nothing from stopping anybody else from adding whatever element type they want to that stack. Right. And the compiler can't help us either here, right? Because we told the compiler this thing is a stack of big O objects. So um, the compiler lets you push whatever you want onto the stack. So for example, here's my uh, same example as before. I have a stack that's supposed to hold only strings, right? So we push three, th three strings onto the stack. Everything's good, right? Now I push the number one onto the stack, uh, which looks suspicious, right? One is not, one is a primitive type, right? But the compiler automatically converts it to the big, uh, to, an in, to a big I integer object using auto boxing. Uh, and then it pushes the integer one onto the stack, right? You can even make another stack, push that onto your stack. You can make a date, push that onto your stack. Everything works, the compiler doesn't care, it runs at runtime, everything's fine. You only run into a problem when you pop something off the stack and you think it's a string and it's not. Okay. So when you pop the stack here and you try to cast to string, thinking that you only have strings on the stack, uh, that's when you get an error. Right, so now the uh, runtime, so now the virtual machine crashes and says, uh, you tried to cast something that's not a string to a string. Uh, so the fact that any element type can be pushed onto a stack makes it impossible to write type safe methods. Right, so a type safe method is a method that um, uh, is a method that you write where you can assume something about the type. So if you try to write some method using your list of op using your stack of objects, um, you can write a method that assumes something about the type. It will compile cleanly, but it then fails at runtime. So for example, you make a stack, uh, you make a method called summon clear. So this is going to take a stack, and it looks like it wants a stack of int. Right? So it looks like it wants a stack of int. It's going to sum the elements in the stack and clear the stack. Right, so all it's going to do is pop all the elements off the stack and compute the sum. Right, so we're assuming that this is a stack of int. So our sum is going to be int or long, right? If you're worried about overflow. While the stack is uh, not empty, pop the stack. Right, now remember, pop returns a big O object. So if I want to convert that element to an integer, right, I have to do that cast on the next line. Right. And then once I cast it to a big I integer, I can now add it to the sum. Right? And then I can return the sum. Right. This is great. This works fine as long as someone only passes you a stack of int or stack of integer, sorry. Right. As soon as someone passes you a stack that has something else on it, the method fails right there. Right. When it tries to pop that element that's not an integer off the stack, uh, you get a cast, cast uh, class cast exception. <laughs> 
there's nothing that the compiler can do to help you here, right? So the compiler can't check, is this a stack of only int objects, right? As far as the compiler is concerned, it has a list of object, sorry, it has a list object stack, right? And this method, uh, and so anybody can pass any stack that they want to this class. If the elements in that stack aren't ints, the method fails. All right, so what we really want is something where we can say that this thing here really is a stack of int or really is a stack of string or really is a stack of something else. Right. And so that's what Java generics let you do. Right. So generics in Java let you uh, parameterize a class interface or method over types. So by parameterize, I mean that you can have a variable. Uh, so the type is now, now becomes a variable. Right. So here I want my type variable to be integer. Right. I want this thing to be a stack of integer. Right. So I want some way to say, hey, this has to be a stack of integer. Right. And that's what the funny angled brackets with the type inside are for in Java. Right. So when you make a, a list of double, you write list angled brackets double inside. That double is your parameter to the class, right? Or your variable, your type variable. So in Java, the way this works uh, is instead of making separate classes for each one of your types, you make one class, right? And then you have a thing here inside of angle brackets that indicates the type that you're working with. Uh, in Java, these classes are type safe, right? So if someone makes a stack of integer, the only thing you can do is add integers to that stack. Every time you pop an element off that stack, it comes back as an integer. And so that lets you write this method safely. Right? Instead of having a list object stack, you can have a stack of angle brackets integer. Right? And you know now that this never fails. Right, so um, you've used generic classes in the course already, right? So you've used list already once, right? Uh, now you're now it's your turn to actually make one of these classes, right? So when you make a generic class, right, it's the same as uh, making a regular class, right? You use the keyword class, then you give it a name. Now the difference is is you put the angle brackets in, and you add however many type variables that you want here, right? Now your type variables these aren't the names of regular types, right? So that's not integer and then string and then something else when you create the class. When you use the class. That's when you say integer, string, double, and so on and so on and so forth, right? But when you create the class, all you use is a name here that is a placeholder or a variable for the type that you want. So typically you see something like T1, T2, T3, up to Tn, or S, T, U, V, W, or something like that. The type names or the type placeholders are very short. Right? So these things inside the angle brackets, when you make the class, Right, are called your type parameters or your type variables. Uh, your type parameters, they have to be some reference type. OK, so when you're making one of your classes, for those uh, type variable names, you typically use one of these or some variation of this. Right, if you're making a collection, often the uh, letter E is used to indicate it's an element. Right. If you're making them, oh, we haven't talked about maps yet. I have to come back to that map and set lecture. Uh, so I'll do that in the next lecture. So K and V would be used for your key and value in a map. Right. A map in Java is just a dictionary in Python. Uh, if your type has to be a number, uh, you might use the capital N to indicate that's a number. And in general, um, so if you just have some type that you need, uh, people just use the word T. Or if you have multiple types, they use S T U V or T1, T2, T3, something like that. OK, so let's look at a very simple example of making a generic class. Right? This is basically the uh, almost the simplest possible example that you can come up with. Right? So remember that in Java, you can only return one value from a method. Right? That's sometimes inconvenient. So if we're searching for the maximum value in a list or an array or something else, um, it would be nice to know the maximum value and the location of the maximum value. Right? So you want to return two things. In Python, you just return a tuple. There are no tuples in Java, so we have to do something else. Uh, one solution is to make a little generic class where one type uh, is the um, uh, is the is the type of value that you're searching the sorry 
is the element type of the array that you're searching over or the list that you're searching over. The other type would be an integer type corresponding to the index. All that we want to do is we want to return the maximum value and the index. So there's no need for a constructor or a method, right? If we make our fields public, we can just use those fields directly. So there's your class, there's your generic class called pair. Right, a pair is just two values, right? The type of the first value is T1. The type of the second value is T2. So someone can make a pair of string and integer, and then T1 would be string, and then T2 would be integer, right? Someone else can make a pair of, say, date and double, right? T1 would be uh, date, and then T2 would become double, right? So these things, that's T1 and T2, they really are just variables, uh, except the variable values now are types. Right. How do you use this thing? OK, so I would like to search a list of integer or its maximum value. Right now, this method is going to return both the maximum value and the index in the list. So it's going to use a pair of integer integer. Right. Uh, one of them will be the index. The second one will be the value, right? the maximum value. Right. How do you uh, how do you write this code? Well, you make a pair object right there. Right. The result is going to hold my value. Uh, I'm going uh, I'm going to assume that the maximum value is located at index zero, right? And that the maximum value's value is the first element in the list, right? And now I'm going to search the rest of the list. So starting at index one, going up to but not including the size, right? get the element out of the list. If the element's bigger than the maximum value, set first to the index, right? But set second to the element. Right, and then return the result, right? Now someone uses result.first to get the index. They use result.second to get the value. And away you go, right? So if this was a list of string, right? Uh, the second is element. So this would become a pair of integer and string, right? And if this was a list of double, this would become integer and double, right? Uh, I guess in a few lectures, um, we can actually change this method so that this doesn't have to be a list of integer. It can be a list of anything. Uh, and this is not a pair of integer comma integer. It will be a pair of integer comma anything. So there's a way to turn this method into a generic method as well. Uh, and so we'll look at that uh, in a few lectures. OK, does everybody get the idea of how this thing works? Right. It's not it's not um, a generic class just looks like a regular class, except now some of your types get to be variables as well. Right. And the, the user of your class gets to specify those uh, type variables. All right. So how do we turn our class our stack into a generic stack now? Right. So. To start with, so we're going to um, we're going to modify the array version of stack and turn it into a generic stack. Right. So if I want to turn it into a generic stack, you need to insert the angle brackets and you need to pick a type variable. Right. So I'm going to use E here. You could use T, he would be fine. I'm using E to indicate that it's an element. Right. Um, I think most people would probably use T. Okay, so there's uh, change number one. Now, change number two is right here. Right. So remember pre previously for our uh, integer stack, we would store the elements in an array of ints. Right now, my elements are of type E. Right, I don't know type E right now. Whoever is going to use the class will tell us what E is later. Right, but anywhere I need to use this type, I just write E. So I want an array of element type E. And so that's where we're going to store our, our elements in. Right, and so you keep on going and you get to the constructor. Right, everything's fine up to this point, right? If you write this, everything will be fine. It's when you hit this point here where you try to actually make that array of elements E, right, uh, that you get a problem. So when you write that line of code there, uh, your IDE or your compiler will tell you that there's a problem here, right? You'll get an error saying something like generic array creation is not allowed. Um, so that looks like uh, the compiler is trying to tell you you can't actually make an array where the type is not known. 
right? Or where the type is a generic type, right? And that is in fact the case, right? So in Java, you're not allowed to make an array of generic type, right? So in other words, I can't write that line of code there. Okay, so if I can't make an array of generic type, it kind of looks like I'm stuck, right? It looks like, well, there's no way to actually implement this class using an array. That's not quite true, right? You can go back to the solution where if I make an array of big O objects, uh, that's, that will also work, right? So I can store any reference type in an array of object. So instead of making the array of, of type E, why don't we make an array of type big O object instead, right? So let's see what happens if we do this. So go back, change your array from E square bracket, square bracket to big O, uh, to big O object, square bracket, square bracket. Right now, when you write new big O object, the compiler is happy. It says, oh yeah, okay, fine. I can make an array of big O object, that's fine, right? It can do this because object is an actual type, right? It's not like E, which has no known type, right? When the, uh, that has no known type to the compiler, right? Big O object is an actual type, so we can make an array of that type. That's just fine. Okay, so why doesn't this work in Java? So the question is, is though, I mean, Java added these generics. It ought to work with arrays. Why doesn't it work with arrays, right? And the reason it doesn't work with arrays is because of the following. Right? So arrays in Java are, are said to be covariant. Right? And so all that means is that if you have an array of objects, right? then that is considered by the language to be the superclass for array of say string, right? And in fact, in Java, if you have an array of objects, that's the superclass for every other array type, right? Every other non-primitive array type. So if sub is a subtype of super, right? Then the array of sub is a subtype of the array of super. Okay, so what does this mean? So what is the implication of this? So will that compile? I make an array of object, right? And on the right-hand side, I make an array of integer, okay? So can I store an array of integer in an array of object variable? And the answer is, well, you go back to the previous page, right? So I have array of object, right? If I change this to integer, is this picture still correct? The answer is yes, right? Big I integer is a subtype of big O object, right? Everything is a subtype of big O object, right? Every reference type is a subtype of big O object, right? So this picture is true, right? Change that to big I integer. That array of big I integer is an array of big O object. Right? So that means this code is legal. Right. I can make an array of integer, store it in an array of, store it in a variable that refers to an array of object. So that's fine. Can I write that? Right. All right, so you look at this and you say, okay, so what's the type on the left-hand side? Right. So that's one of the elements from this array. Right. Each element in this array is a big O object. Right. So the type on the left-hand side is big O object. Now, what's the type on the right-hand side? That's string. Is string a big O object? The answer is yes. So does this compile? The answer is yes. Right. String is substitutable for big O object. Right. Therefore, I can store that, uh, that, uh, that reference in that array. Now, this looks weird, right? I said that the actual, that the array that's actually sitting here is an array of integer, right? And the compiler is letting me store a string in that array. Right. Does it run? The answer is no. It compiles, but it doesn't run. Right. Only when you run it, right, does the compiler actually, or no, sorry, does the virtual machine actually try to store a string into this array? Right. When it tries to store that string in the array, it realizes, oh, it's trying to store a string in an array of integer, and it barfs. Right. And now it says, I can't store a string in an array of integer. Right. Uh, and it crashes with an exception. So that's no good, right? So you want to avoid this situation happening, right? You don't want to, right? So again, remember this code is legal to write, it just doesn't run. Right? Uh, and so you want to avoid this from happening, right? And so uh, 
to, to, to make sure that this doesn't happen, when the language designers decided to create generics, they decided to make generics to be invariant. Right? So unlike when you had an array of objects, right, an array of string would be a subtype of that, uh, or, uh, would be a subtype. With generics, that doesn't, that's not true. Right? If you have a list of object, right, then a list of string is not a subtype of a list of object. Right. In fact, there's no relationship between that class and that class there. Right. So a list of string is not a subtype or a supertype of a list of object in this case. Right. The, the inheritance relationship doesn't apply here, and that prevents someone from making a list of object here and storing a list of string in that uh, uh, in that uh, variable. Right. So for example. Exact same example, this time I'm changing it to list instead of array, right? So if I have a list of objects, can I store an array list of integer in that variable? The answer is no, right? The, uh, that does not happen, right? The, the compiler will not allow this to happen. Right? So arrays and uh, arrays don't behave nicely when uh, you work with generics, right? They don't behave the way you want them to, right? And so uh, uh, that's why you're prevented from making an array of generic type. Right. If they let you make an array of generic type, you would run into, uh, you could actually run code that looks like this. Is that true? You'd actually run code. You'd run into problems when you actually try to, uh, you run into funny problems like this. Okay, so that was a bit of an aside. Let's finish off the rest of the class. Right. Push and pop uh, are basically the exact same as what they looked like when we implemented them in the first place. Right. So here's push. Instead of pushing an int now, we push an, uh, an element of type E. Right. Instead of, so here, nothing changes, right? So if there's room in the array to hold the element, nothing changes. We simply add one to top index and then simply add, go into the array and add the element uh, at index top index. Right. The only thing that changes here now is if we have to resize the array. Right, so if we resize the array, our new array has type big O object now, right? And so that changes from int to big O object, and that's it. Everything else stays the same. Right. So one tiny little change there. Right. What about pop? So pop needs one little change right there, right? So in pop, this thing here used to be an int, and we used to store that in a variable of type int. Right now, the generic type now our type is E, right? So our element type is E. You need a cast here because uh, the compiler thinks that this dot stack is a list is a an array of big O object. So we have to cast our big O object to type E instead. This cast is illegal, so this in fact does work. Right now, this cast would fail at runtime. If whatever was sitting in the array did not have type E, right? But we know for a fact that what is sitting in the array has type E because the only way to put something into the stack is with push. And push always takes an element of type E. So this cast is always safe. When you write this line of code, the compiler will try to warn you, right? Eclipse will say, hey, this might be unsafe, right? But as the programmer, you can check your code and realize that this, in fact, is always safe. The element type in the array is always of type E. Right, and that's it. So that's the only change you have to make. One, two, and then in pop, there's one there. Oops, sorry. Right, so converting that stack of string or stack of int or whatever else, right? Uh, oh, sorry. So converting that class, that stack of int, so that it became a generic class, was relatively easy to do. Right, yes, you have to get used to the syntax. But the number of changes you actually have to make are very small. Right? If you want to convert an interface to become a generic interface, it's even easier. Right? All you do is change a bunch of types. Right? So there was our original stack interface. Right? So this was an interface for a stack of strings. Right? So push takes a string, pop returns a string. Right? Convert this to a generic interface. That's it. Right? Add your generic type variable here. Right, so we now have a stack of some element type E. E, right? Push 
now requires an element of type E and pop returns an element of type E and that's it. So converting a um, interface to a generic interface is even easier than converting a class to a generic class. Okay, finally, uh, we can take our array stack class, right? And now say that it implements the generic stack interface, right? So our array stack of type E implements the interface stack of type E. And now you're done, right? You've got a full uh, generic stack interface and a class that implements the stack interface. So we fully generified our um, one version of our stack class. Uh, and so that's the introduction to uh, creating a, your own generic type in Java. Anybody have any questions about, um, about what was presented here? All right, so the mechanics are pretty straightforward. Uh, you just have to get used to the fact that you have a variable now that's a type, right? Uh, so that's not something that you ever have to deal with in Python, right? And uh, this is the first time we're dealing with it in this course, right? The syntax is a little wonky, right? This angle bracket and uh, business here, right? The reason the syntax is funny is because uh, generics were added into the language uh, very late. Right. There was many versions of Java before they decided to insert generics into the language. All right, so that was lecture deck number 27. 26 is, uh, so I think it's 26 in the, on, on Q, but the file is actually called 27. So one of them is missing. Either 26 or 27 is actually missing. Uh, it's just a numbering uh, mistake. All right. So the next uh, lecture is basically it's another it's another it's another example of, of creating a generic type. So instead of working with a stack, though, we're going to implement a queue now. In, uh, in uh, we're going to create a generic queue. So a queue is a sim is similar to a stack in that it's a linear sequence of elements, right? The difference between a queue and a stack, though, is that in a queue. Uh, there's the notion of the front of the queue and the back of a queue, right? So a queue is just like a line of people, right? At, uh, I guess in this case, waiting to uh, be served somehow, right? Maybe this is the line of Starbucks or something, right? So in, in a queue, in an orderly queue, right? Everybody gets in line. The first person out of the queue is the one at the front of the queue, right? Every time someone joins the queue, they join the queue at the back, right? So the difference compared to a stack, right? In a stack, everything happens at the top of the stack, right? In a queue, now something happens at both the front and the back, right? Things come out at the front, things go in the back. So queues only support, class, classically, they only support two operations, right? There's a method called NQ and there's a method called DQ, right? NQ adds an element to the back of the queue, right? And DQ removes the element from the front of the queue, uh, and typically it returns that element back to the core. Uh, if you try to DQ an empty queue, that's often, that's typically an error of some kind. Right, and you might want to add extra operations to your queue, right? You might want to know how many how many elements are in the queue, is the queue empty, right? Uh, there's often a peak for a front or back method. Uh, so those methods let you look at an element without removing it, right? So peak or front, would let you get the front element without taking it out. Uh, back or peak back or something like that would let you look at the last element in the queue without removing it. You might want to search a queue for a particular element, um, but classically, a queue uh, queues don't support that operation. And there's a whole bunch of other things too, right? So in Java, you would probably implement to string. You'd probably implement equals. If you implement equals, you have to implement hash code, right? Um, and you can imagine other possibly useful queue operations. OK, so I'm going to show you a picture of what happens uh, in a queue. Uh, it's a little bit deceiving, though, you get to DQ. So in an empty queue, uh, we're going to keep track. So in a queue, we're going to keep track of the front and back elements somehow. Right, so in an empty queue, there are, there are no elements. So front and back both have invalid values, right? They don't actually point at anything. Right. So when you NQ something into this queue, front and back both point at the same element. Right. So front is A, back is A. 
you enqueue another element, right? That element joins the back of the queue. Right. And now you have to update uh, that red arrow so that it points at the new back element. Right. And queue another element, right? So that element joins the back of the queue. And then you update uh, the red arrow so it points at the new back element. Right. So on. So on. Right there. Right. So there's a queue with five elements in it. Now, when you dequeue the queue, right, the elements are going to come out at the front. So if I dequeue the first element, right, it comes out, gets returned to the caller. And so conceptually, so in a physical queue, everybody moves forward in the line, right? But if you're going to implement this as an array, right, imagine this is an array of elements or a list, right? So remember when you take something out of that array, Right. If you have to shuffle all of these elements forward in that array, right, that's going to take. You have to move four elements, right? If you had n elements in the array, you would have to move n minus one elements, right? So if you implement a DQ by shuffling the elements forward one position, your DQ operation would be in big O of n, right? uh, which you don't want, right? These types of data structures, you want them to run very fast. So you want O1 complexity for adding and removing elements, right? So remove another element from the queue, so the B is gonna come out, right? Conceptually, everything shuffles forward one position, right? And so on and so on, right? Eventually you get to the uh, situation where there's only one element in the queue, right? Again, notice front and back both point to the same element, right? And when that element comes out, when that element comes out, uh, it gets returned to the caller, you now have an empty queue, Front, nothing happens to front and back. Okay, so that queue is what's called a FIFO data structure, right? First in, first out, right? The first element that joins the queue is the first element that comes out, right? Uh, or it's last in, last out, right? So the last element that joins the queue is the last element that comes out. Uh, in computing science and computer engineering, uh, these things are used all over the place, right? So if you're, uh, on a web server, a web server typically has a queue of uh, pending requests, right? So every time someone clicks the link on Amazon, right, that request goes to Amazon server, gets stuck in a queue somewhere, and then it gets served by the web server, right? Uh, and so when you have millions of people using the website at the same time, right, you've got these queues of lots and lots of requests that need to be serviced, right? Anytime uh, you have a resource, one resource that needs to be managed, Right, it's often managed using a queue of some kind. Right, so for example, your computer, your operating system needs to manage uh, uh, needs to manage what process gets access to the CPU. Right, because you only have one CPU. Right, you might have many things running on your on your computer at once, though. Right, so each one of those processes needs its own little slice of time on the CPU. Right, there's a queue that manages the processes that need access to your CPU uh, on your computer. Right, networking is typically managed with queues. Algorithms are often written using queues. So the classic implementation of breadth first search uh, is typically implemented with a queue. Right? There's a whole branch of mathematics that studies this sort of stuff called queuing theory. Um, uh, I don't know if there's a course at Queens that talks about this, uh, but if it is, it's probably up in fourth year of grad school. Thank you. All right, so let's implement one of these things. We already know about interfaces. We know about generic interfaces. We might as well start out by making a generic interface. Okay. Uh, the reason we're going to make an interface is because we're going to implement the queue uh, in several different ways. Right? We would like to be, we would like uh, anyone using one of our classes right, to be able to use the class in the same way. Right? So in other words, we would like our classes to provide this interface here. Right? Anybody that wants to use our queue knows that these methods exist for our classes. So our interface includes a method called size, the number of elements in the queue. There is an is empty method that returns true if the queue is empty. Right. We can make this a default method and provide an implementation right, the exact same way that we did with stack. NQ and DQ are essentially push and pop. Right. So they look exactly the same, except their names are different. 
Right. Front and back are uh, the methods that return uh, the front and back elements of the queue without removing them from the queue. And again, you can add other methods here if you wanted to. All right, so if we use a list to, to implement the queue, right, just like we use the list to implement the stack, right, everything's exactly the same except for uh, DQ. Right? So to DQ the stack, you remove the first element. Right. Unlike pop where you remove the last element. So everything's exactly the same. Right. Instead of stack, we've got instead of list stack, you've got list queue. Right. Inside the list, we have a list. Uh, sorry, inside the queue, we have a list that represents the elements of the, that holds the elements of the queue. Right. NQ simply adds the elements to the back of the list. Right. And DQ. Uh, simply removes the first element from the front of the list. Right? There's a little method here called throw if empty that throws an exception if the queue is empty and you try to do something with it. Right? So unlike a stack, right? So remember a stack we removed at the back of the stack, right? So we removed the last element, the last element from the list that held the elements for the stack. Right? If you remove the last element from a list, that happens in O1 time, right? Constant time. If you remove from the front of an array based list, that happens in O n time. So our DQ operation uh, using a an array list has uh, an O n DQ operation, right? Which we don't want. Front simply returns the first element. Back simply returns the last element, right? If you wanted to, you can put in a two string because we're using a list to represent the queue. Right, we can just use its two string method uh, and that works just fine. OK, so implementing the queue with the list is dead easy, right? We have the one disadvantage that its DQ operation is in ON time, right? So can we try to get a better complexity than ON? So the answer is if you use array list, the answer is no, you're stuck. So if you want better than O n time, it looks like we're going to have to do this ourselves, right? So let's try to do this with an array instead. See what happens. Right? Now it's going to look a lot like the stack implementation, right? Except you have to remember that in a queue, stuff happens at both ends of the queue, right? Whereas in the array, uh, sorry, within a stack, the only thing that happens happens at the end of the uh, at the end of the array in an array-based stack. Right? So if you're going to implement a queue and you want it to be efficient, this becomes a little bit tricky. It's not that tricky. It's a little tricky, right? So we're going to use four fields now to represent our uh, queue, right? We want an array to hold the elements of the queue, right? We want to know how many elements are in the queue, so we need a field called size, right? Front is going to be the index of the element currently at the front of the queue and back will be the element, uh, the index of the element currently at the back of the queue, right? So those red arrows, we're going to keep track of those with an index. Sorry, the red and blue arrow that I showed you in the uh, uh, animated slide, right? We're going to use front and back. So there's a picture of an empty queue, right? So brand new queue created with a no argument constructor. We're going to make an, uh, an array. It looks like a length of 16, right? There's going to be nothing in the array. So the, the array has all null values in it. Right. We're going to decide to make front be zero and back be negative one. Right? There's nothing actually special about those values. You could pick different values if you wanted to. Uh, so we're just going to go with that. Right. I guess the only thing that's important is that uh, back is one position behind front uh, when you make the new queue. Right? Otherwise, you can make these anywhere. And you can make the point anywhere inside that array if you wanted to. OK, so what does NQ do? So NQ is exactly like push. Uh, so you're going to add the element to the back of the queue, right? That's exactly like pushing an element to the top of the stack, right? So uh, we have to deal with uh, the fact that if the size of if the array is full, we have to resize the array, right? Exactly like we did with the stack, right? Instead of top, right? Our the relevant variable in this case is now back, right? So we move back one position to the right. And then you set the element at that index to the element that you want to add to the queue. 
right? Exactly like stack, right? This is sorry, exactly like the pop operation, push operation in stack, right? So when you NQ one element into an empty queue, right? Back was here, it moves to here, right? Now you set that element to the element that you want to NQ, right? NQ again, right? Back moves over one position, set that element. Again, right? Back moves over one position, set that element. Right. So after five NQ operations, it looks like this, which is exactly what a stack would look like if you pushed five elements onto the stack. What about dequeuing? So now, so to dequeue, right, I need to take that A out. Right. So the A comes out. What I don't want to do is I don't want to move the B over, then the C over, then the D over, then the E over. Right. If I have to do that, that becomes ON, and we're already stuck in that situation. Right. So instead, when we remove the A, all I'm going to do is move front one position to the right. right. So to DQ, I'm going to remember what's currently at the front of the queue. Right. I'm going to go into the array and set the current front element to null. I'll explain why we do that in just a second. Right. I'm going to move front one position to the right. Right. And then I'm going to return the element. Right, that we had at the beginning. So if I DQ the element that was here, right, I'm going to remember that was an A. I'm going to move front one position to the right. Right, I'm going to set that element to null. Right? I think there's a step missing here. Yes, there is a step missing here. I'm going to decrease the size of the queue by one. Right, and then I'm going to return the A back to the caller. Right now. When we implemented a stack, right, uh, we had a stack of int, I think, if I remember correctly. So when you have a stack of int, you can't null out the elements in, a in an array of int, right? That doesn't work, right? Null only works for reference types. So uh, why am I, so you could set it to zero, but there's no point setting it to zero, right? It doesn't matter what number is sitting in the array of int. Here, it kind of matters what element is sitting here now, right? So if I don't set this to null, right, there would be something sitting here instead, right? There would be a reference to that string A. As long as that reference to the string A exists, the uh, virtual machine can't remove that A, that string A from memory, right? So in other words, if you DQ the Q, right, you return the string back to the caller and the caller doesn't do anything with the string, Right, you should be able to get rid of that string from memory, right? So, but if you leave a reference to that string in the array, then you can't get rid of the virtual machine can't remove that uh, value from memory. If you set it to null, though, that removes the reference to that string, right? And now the virtual machine can get rid of that. Uh, it can get rid of that string object, right? You think you might think this doesn't matter. If there's just one object sitting here. Why does it matter whether or not you get rid of it, right? If your queue has a million elements in it and you take everything out of the queue, and you don't set the elements to null, right? you're still stuck holding on to a million objects somewhere in memory. Right? So it turns out, in this case, it's fairly important that you do, in fact, null out the array element here. OK, so DQ again. Right? So when you DQ again, you're going to remember what the B is. Right? You're going to move front over one position. You're going to null out that element. You're going to decrease the size by one, and then you're going to return the B back to the caller. OK, and eventually you can get to the situation here, right? So keep on dequeuing, right? If you dequeue again, right? Front moves over one position to the right, and notice we're in the situation where front and back are now side by side, right? Front is one position to the right of back, right? And that looks like the original situation when we had an empty queue. Right. So you might think that you don't actually have to keep track of the size of the queue, right? The number of elements in the queue. You can just use front and back and do some arithmetic to compute the size, right? It turns out that's not necessarily the case, right? Even though this looks like the original empty queue, there is a situation where you can have front and back look like this, and the queue is in fact not empty, right? So we'll look at that in the next lecture because uh, we're out of time right now. <laughs>
right, good morning, everyone. Oh, wait, what's going on here? Sorry. 